Well, gee, thanks for showing up for the third talk. You know, I expect by the third talk you've got an audience this big. <laughs> All right, so um, um, I am going to more or less assume that you've... Oh, we lost one already. <laughs> Anybody else? Can we, uh, yeah. yeah. Ask someone to explain invitations to you after the talk. Okay. Okay. I will. All right. So um, um, I, I think the title of this talk was Boundaries of Groups, but I'd really like to go back to the title of the overall um, ser series of talks, which was Hyperbolicity and Beyond. So if you were here yesterday, we went into some detail on what it meant to be hyperbolic and how that um, condition was useful for studying groups. Okay. So um, um, what is, so a hyperbolic group is one which has a nice action, we call it a geometric action, um, on a hyperbolic metric space. Uh. All right, it doesn't, don't worry too much about the technical conditions. The action has to be by isometries, proper co-compact, some, some nice conditions, some nice action on a hyperbolic metric space. And um, that's kind of what we talked about last time. And uh, um, in my first talk, I mentioned that, um, uh, oh, I should say that what uh, all the material I talked about last time sort of dates back to Gromov in the early 90s and, and, and has been around for a while. And then people have been using it to do all kinds of different things in the meantime. But what's going on today is people are very interested in seeing if some of the techniques that were developed for hyperbolic groups, to study hyperbolic groups, could be used to study so, uh, other classes of groups. All right? So um, I, I, said, I said in um, my first lecture that there were two ways that uh, have, have been quite effective in doing this. One was to um, loosen up the conditions on the action. Say, well, the action still needs to satisfy something, but it doesn't need to be quite as nice as we were insisting on here. So um, we could loosen conditions on the action. And that's led to various notions like um, acylindrically hyperbolic and hierarchically hyperbolic. That's, that there's a whole class of groups for which people are studying those, ki those kinds of um, questions. All right? The other thing we could do is um, loosen conditions on the space, x, on, on this hyperbolicity. All right? And that's what I want to talk about today, because that's, that's an area I've been working on. So I want to talk about some of, some of the um, kinds of things we can do in this direction and what, and what we can get out of it. All right? OK, so the, the idea, so let me go back to one other thing um, from, um, um, from my first talk, is that given, given a nice geodesic metric space, it's often the case that there are kind of some directions that look hyperbolic and some directions that don't. And that's what I want to make use of. So let's just remember um, this particular space. So, so in general, um, a geodesic metric space so all our spaces are geometric, geodesic metric spaces, meaning distances are measured by the lengths of the minimal, minimal length paths. So um, in general, geodesic metric space x um, may um, have um, some directions. I'll put this in quote, which um, are hyperbolic, or some, some behavior, never mind direction, some behavior which is hyperbolic and other behavior which isn't, so which are hyperbolic. And others, which are not. So, the the example um, to keep in mind, and that I gave last time, was um, the case of the universal cover of um, um, of a circle wedge a torus. So we have a circle, and we glue it onto a torus. And I said, if you look at the universal cover of that, it's what I call the tree of flats. 
So the flats are the covers of this. A flat is just a plane, a flat plane, all right, a Euclidean plane. And I said that if you pass to the universal cover, what you see is a plane covering this guy, all right? But at each um, lattice point on the plane, you see, you see an edge coming out, one, one going upward and one going downward, all right? You, so you, I'll just draw the upward ones for now, but there are more of them coming out down here. And you see a whole bunch of those. But at the end, if I follow any one of those, I hit a plane again. If I lift this thing, I, it's a line in the universal cover. But at the end of that line is, again, another plane. And each one of these has a plane attached at the end of it, which doesn't touch any of the other planes. And now you do it again, and you have more planes, and you have more planes. And so I call this a tree. It's a tree-like structure with these big, big flats sticky, stuck in there, OK? So tree of flats. We'll come back to this, so keep this one in mind. Or tree of planes, if you like that better. OK? So my point was here, we, we looked at this space, and we said, if you sort of travel mostly upward, you ha it has this very tree-like feeling. And if you look at triangles that mostly travel upward and downwards, they're going to be very slim. All right? They're going to behave like hyperbolic things. But if you let yourself just travel horizontally, for a long way, then it feels like you're in a plane. And, and triangles can be very fat and, and, and bad. Okay? So somehow there's this kind of nice, you know, this hyperbolic-like feeling of a tree going this way, and this, um, this plane, this, this feeling of a plane, which is definitely not hyperbolic when you travel this way. Right? So the idea is going to be to somehow formalize that, encode it, and then use it. To, 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 um, to do things we do with hyperbolic groups. OK, that's the, that's the motivation behind what we're going to do. OK, so, um, um, so what is it? So how might we encode this idea? So I talked here about directions, OK? So, and in this picture, it really is directions, horizontal or vertical. We like vertical. We don't like horizontal. Well, what about stuff that it's a little bit of each, goes a little horizontal, you know, that stuff in between, right? You might want to go up like this, where you do a little bit of horizontal and a little diagonal. So, so it turns out one way to, to talk about directions is by looking at, starting at some point and looking at geodesic rays out towards infinity. All right? You, you look at, you start somewhere and you take a geodesic and you keep going and you talk about that as being a direction, a direction towards infinity. So what we're going to do to encode this information is we're going to encode it in what we call a boundary. We're going to look at, we're going to look at a boundary for our space and, and try to identify what we like and what we don't like along the boundary. Okay? All right, so, um, so idea, the, the motivation is idea, encode um, the good directions, the hyperbolic-like directions, in a boundary. OK, so that's, the, that's where the boundary comes in. So that's the, that's the sort of overview of where we want to go. So what I actually want to start with, though, is talking about boundaries of hyperbolic space. What are they? How do they act? And then try to see how we can make something similar for something like this. So let's go back to hyperbolic space for a moment. So hyperbolic boundaries. OK, so um, we're going to take x now to be a delta hyperbolic space. So remember, that means that all of the triangles are delta slim. All right, I'm, I guess I'm going to sort of assume people were here yesterday, or at least the day before, or one of those two talks. All right, so um, the x is a delta hyperbolic space. And let me just throw in um, to avoid, uh, just to be technically correct, I'm always going to assume my spaces are proper. And that means just the closed balls are compact. It's not going to play a big role, but I, I just need the assumption that closed balls are compact in, in my space. Okay. All right. So, um, um, we're, so I, I want to define the boundary of X. Um, well, what if you if you envision? So, what's our classical model here of a hyperbolic space? It's like the hyperbolic plane, right? So uh, the hyperbolic, the, the image of the hyperbolic plane that I was using in my, in my first talk was the so-called Poincaré disk model. 
which was, you know, had those triangles, everybody remember, and they said they were all the same size. So, so um, it, it, but the points were points in an open disk, right? So, and if you were to start at some point and look at all the ways to travel to infinity, what would you see? You'd see a circle of directions, right? The, th the points at the boundary would be the boundary circle of that disk, yes? It's not there in the hyperbolic plane. The hyperbolic plane is an open thing, but we want to add them in as being, creating a boundary, an infinity, all right? So um, what is the boundary? It it's, um, consists of rays. It's um, the set alpha um, mapping. Um, so a ray is, ma maps the half infinite line, half the line into x is a geodesic ray. And I'm going to mod out by an equivalence relation that you might think is unnecessary in this picture, but let me mod it out by this equivalence relation. I'll show you why, which is that um, we want to, in, so, so it turns out we don't always want to fix a base point. All right? Sometimes we fix a base point, but we don't necessarily want to fix a base point. And if we don't fix a base point, then we want that ray to be the same as that ray to be the same as that. If they're all going to the same point at infinity, we want to consider them equivalent. All right? So to avoid having to fix a base point, um, we'll, we're going we're gonna to say alpha is equivalent to beta if um, this is the shorthand that's called the Hausdorff distance between alpha and beta is is less than infinity, and all that means is that alpha lives in a bounded neighborhood of beta, beta lives in a bounded neighborhood of alpha. They, they, they stay bounded distance from each other. They, don't, they never get infinitely far apart. They, w there's some neighborhood of one that contains, that contains the other and vice versa. All right, so, so they're asymptotic. They're going to stay bounded distance from each other. All right, so um, that's, that's how we define the, the um, um, boundary. And um, let me say a word about the topology. It has a natural topology, um, which is um, sort of easier to think about if you do fix a base point. Um, it, 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 it turns out there's, um, uh, I shouldn't get into this, but I will anyway. Okay. <laughs> I, can't, I can't avoid it. It turns out you can fix a base point, and there's always a representative at, at the base point. So, if you want to fix a base point and it's easier to think about it, where everything starts at the same point, it's okay. The reason we tend not to is we want to look at group actions, and the group action's not going to fix your base point anymore. So if you want to allow for group actions on this thing, then I have to allow the base point to move. But if you're just not worrying about a group action and just want to picture your boundary, it's fine to start just work from a single base point. It works perfectly well. All right? So. Um, okay, so for the topology, let's work from base points a little easier. Um, what we want is, what does it mean for two points to be close on here? Well, it basically means that the geodesics, well, they can't stay close forever because then they'd be the same point. But they could stay close for a long time before they start going apart. Yes? So a neighbor, so you make a, a neighborhood, a neighborhood, what's called a neighborhood basis, things that stay close to alpha are, are other, other rays, and it turns out it's close will be two delta in this case, where delta is, is, the, is the hyperbolicity, that delta, um, for a long time. So a long time is R. The bigger R gets, the smaller the neighborhood gets, and I'm getting things that get closer and closer and closer. So that turns out to give a neighborhood basis for the topology. It's a things that um, um, this is a neighborhood. All the geodesics that stay two delta close for dist for t you know for the first R stretch. Okay, so don't so maybe that's too much detail, but this is a good picture to keep in mind. It's what you think it is. You go to infinity, and two things are close if they stay close for a long time. Okay, all right. Okay, so um, let's look at a couple of examples. We already have one here. So quickly, um, one is x is the hyperbolic plane. And sure enough, the boundary of x is what we expect. It's the circle at infinity. Okay, it's just what we expect it to be. Okay, so here's another one. What else did we have that was hyperbolic? Um, how about a tree? All right, that, that was hyperbolic. That was zero hyperbolic. All right, so um, um, what's the boundary look like? Well, um, let's take a base point just because it's easier to think starting from base point. Starting from base point and look at rays to infinity, all right? 
Well, I'm, I'm going to take my tree and I'm going to hold the base point up and let everything flow downward from there. All right. I mean, just, you know, so here's my base point. And then at the base point, I have some number of edges coming out. Just for convenience, I'm going to draw two edges from each. But you could do this with any, however many edges. But, ah, and it keeps going, right? My tree, yeah? OK, so what does it mean to go to infinity, to start at the base point and go to infinity? So I start here, and I have to choose left or right. All right, I'm going to choose left. Now I have to choose left or right again. I'll just choose right. Let's choose this one. Let's choose this one. And you keep going. At each point, you choose left or right, left or right. Okay? And two things are close to each other, in this case, if they are actually equal to each other for a long way before they, and at some point, they diverge. But if they stay exactly along the same route, distance r, and then they diverge, then, you know, they're, then they're close, depending on how big r is. Okay? Anybody know what that space is, the limit of that space? It's the Cantor set, because at each point you're choosing left or right, this half or that half at every point, and then you're choosing this half or that half again, you know, this side or that side. So it's always a Cantor set, all right? So it turns out on the boundary of a tree is a Cantor set. Okay, so these can have all different um, topologies, and you know, you can get different spaces, interesting spaces coming from that. Um, okay, um, any, any question? Uh, just all you need is an intuition here. You're going to infinity, looking at ways to go to infinity. All right. Okay, so we were talked a lot last time about large scale geometry and why it was important in 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 um, geometric group theory. So. Um, um, because what we'd really like to do is talk about the boundary of a group, all right? And to do that, we would like that we would like that our properties are preserved by quasi-isometries. That was the, the whole the whole issue was last time. We said ideally we're interested in properties that um, are preserved by these by these quasi-isometries. So so you might ask, okay. What about the boundary? So for example, maybe I want to define the boundary in my group to be the boundary of a Cayley graph. All right? So what should the boundary of the group mean? Well, let's, how about the boundary of its Cayley graph? Yeah, but there are different Cayley graphs, and are they all going to have the same boundary? All right? So does this, is this well defined? Is this a good, a, a good notion? So um, if you had to just guess, I mean, just intuitively, Surely going to infinity is a large scale property, right? I mean, geez, you know, it's, it, um, what's more large scale than heading off to infinity, right? So, so certainly your intuition would be, yes, this is encoding something large scale. And um, sure enough, um, good news is um, we have um, theorem, Gromov for a change. So we're still in the old stuff. Okay? We haven't got to the new stuff yet. This is still stuff we already knew. So um, Gromov. Um, is um, exactly what we want, a quasi-isometry between two um, um, f mapping x into y between um, hyperbolic metric spaces induces um, a, a homeomorphism that's the best we can ask for, really, at this point. We don't even have metrics yet on this. Right now, it's just a topological space, the boundary. So a homeomorphism, um, let's just, let's call it boundary f, from the boundary of x to the boundary of y. OK, so that's good news. We really could define the boundary of the group to be, um, so in particular, we can talk about boundary of g is well-defined. Um, um, it's, it's not only well-defined up to homeomorphism, it's a well-defined um, quasi-isometry invariant. Namely, what do I mean by that? Um, I said one of the sort of meta questions in geometric group theory is when are two groups quasi-isometric to each other? All right, that's a big question. Are they quasi-isometric to each other? Well, if they had different boundaries, they're not, they can't be quasi-isometric to each other. So it's a sort of an invariant. It's something you can look at to try to distinguish between two groups. Are they quasi-isometric or aren't they? And one of the things you could check is whether their boundaries are, are, are homeomorphic or not. All right? 
So this property means that these, this is a really useful, you know, we could talk about the boundary of a group, it makes good sense, and we could compare boundaries of two groups to decide whether they, they look quasi homeomorphic or not, and whether they're quasi-isometric or not. Okay, so we have this um, um, tool. Let me say a little more about it. Um, all right, so this is really good property. They, these boundaries have a lot of other good properties as well that make them, so what, what, what are these boundaries useful for? It turns out for hyperbolic groups, they've been used for all kinds of stuff to study dynamics, to study um, rigidity theorems, to study um, geodesic flows, to study, they've been, they've been used to do all kinds of things with these groups, these groups and spaces. And um, uh, what I'd like to do is just list a couple of the key properties of these boundaries that make them so useful. All right, Why, what, what, is it, what is it that um, makes, makes them so useful? So key properties of hyperbolic boundaries. Um, all right, I'll just, do, I'll just do a quick list. All right, so I'm assuming my space is hyperbolic and I've taken its boundary. So here's one. Um, boundary X is um, compact um, and metrizable. In fact, it has a very natural metric on it, which I'll s s draw a picture of in a minute. Metrizable. Um, and in fact, a, in fact, you know, you can take not just the boundary of x, you can take x union the boundary of x, you know, your disk with, the, with its boundary on, and you've compactified your space. So being able to compactify a space is always a useful thing um, in studying it. So we, we, it gives you a way to compactify your space. Um, two, um, a, 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 a convenient uh, fact is, is that any two points on boundary x are um, joined by um, a bi-infinite geodesic in X. So what do I mean? Well, I've got these two points on the boundary, and I can always find a bi-infinite geodesic that goes from one to the other. I call this the visibility property. So if you think of light as traveling along geodesics, I'm standing at one point on the boundary, and I want to know what other points on the boundary I can see. Can I see them all? And the answer is I can see everything. There's always a bi-infinite geodesic that gets me from where I'm standing to any other point on the boundary. Okay, So maybe I want to see this point. I can do that. Maybe I want to see this point. I can do that. There's these bi-infinite geodesics that connect any point to any other point. All right. Um, interestingly, um, this is a useful in, for example, if I want to, just to show you um, that how this is a useful fact. Let's say I wanted to construct a metric. All right, here's one way to do it. Um, I could um, fix a base point. I'm going to pick a base point. All right, and now I want to say, what, what 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 do you think? I mean, just from the hyperbolic case. I mean, you could have two points that are far away. They're going to do this, right? or two points that are kind of close, they're going to do this, right? Yes, I mean, it, just intuitively, what's close, what's far? So how can I measure that? I'm going to measure it by looking at how far it is from my base point to this connecting geodesic. So given any two points on the boundary, I connect them by one of these geodesics, and then I measure how far that, and the farther away it is, the closer those points are. I mean, it's e to the minus whatever, whatever, whatever. I mean, but you can define a metric that essentially determines, the dis the, determines the, the, the how far apart they are by looking at the, the bi-infinite geodesic. So we're sort of using this to get, the, to get the metric property. Okay, So there's lots of nice things that come out of these. Um, what else? Um, um, oh, supposing I have just a single isometry. So um, uh, an, an isometry, let's see, let's phrase this right. Um, if um, G mapping X to itself is an infinite order order isometry. Then, um, first of all, there's an induced map. You get an induced map from X. Obviously, from an isometry is going to induce a map from the boundary to the boundary. You get an induced map, and it fixes at most 
two points on the boundary. Um, yeah, what do I want to say about this? So, uh, sorry, this is just mapped to itself. Um, um, so, so, so um, um, yeah, this has been used to classify isometries. So I look at an isometry on x. I look at this map on x. And there's three possibilities. One is that it's finite order, in which case we call it elliptic, if it's finite order. That, or it could fix a single point on the boundary, and those are called parabolic isometries. Or it could fix two points on the boundary, and those are called loxodromic isometries. And with this classification of isometries plays a, a large role in the study of e either the hyperbolic plane or more general spaces. So this is used to classify isometries into different, according to their behavior, on the boundary. All right, so that's another important property. Um, for, um, um, let's take a whole group acting. If G acts um, geometrically on X, uh, let's see, what was the, uh, oh yeah, any dynamical systems people in here? All right, G acts then the induced action Induced action on x, on boundary x um, is what's called minimal, which means um, all orbits are dense. Okay, I'm not going to say too much about that, but you know, having a minimal action is important if you do dynamical. If you're interested in dynamical. Um, properties of, 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 of something, okay? So that's a, another key property. And the last one is, um, is a, 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 a strengthened version of the one I already wrote on here. So it turns out that there is a um, kind of a converse of that. So the last property is five. All right, so I already said in that theorem over there that if f mapping x into y is a quasi-isometry, um, then that, and this is Gromov's theorem, then, um, um, then it induces, then we get, uh, and I'm going to call it capital F now instead of boundary F, because you'll see why, because I want to go in the other direction. Then we get an induced map from boundary x to boundary y, is a hom which is a homeomorphism. That's what, that, that's what that theorem says over there, OK? It turns out there's kind of a converse of this. So not only, not only does the boundary um, encode the, the quasi-isometry type, but it, if, the hum, if the boundaries are appropriately equivalent, you can get back. You can get back the other way. So to get back, I need two more properties. So um, if, it's, if it comes, if we start with f and we look at the induced map, then this homeomorphism satisfies two properties, um, which I will um, simply not, not actually define, but they're called quasi-mobius um, and um, quasi-conformal. And um, if you know, if, if, if you know um, hyperbolic geometry, you've run into the no I, I, I may If I have time at the end, I'm going to explain these in more detail. But if you've run into, um, if you've done hyperbolic geometry, you may have heard the words Mobius or conformal. And guess what? Quasi Mobius, quasi conformal means up to some bounded distortion. So, you know, they're almost, not quite exactly, but almost um, Mobius or, or conformal. So it turns out that um, um, this, this homeomorphism satisfies both of these properties. And what um, Paul Ann proved is that if either of these properties hold, either of them, either this or this, you could go back the other way. In other words, if you had a homeomorphism on the boundaries that came from who knows where, you were just given a homeomorphism, and it satisfied either one of these properties, it must have come from a quasi-isometry. It must have been induced by quasi-isometry. So on some level, this says that the boundary completely determines the quasi-isometry type of the. It, yes, but going the other way. OK, so this direction, it satisfies both. Right. You only need one to turn your, yeah. Right. If it satisfies one, it will satisfy the other. That's correct. Okay. 
But the, the theorem says this is true if and only if this is true if and only if this is true. Right. It's a three part, you know, you don't need both of them to get back again. Right. Um, but that's right. You get the other one for free. That's right. You get the other one for free. Exactly. Exactly. Um, okay, so this says that, it's a, this says that it, um, these things are not only the boundary uh, of, of a group or a hyperbolic group or a hyperbolic space um, is a very, very strong quasi-isometry invariant. Really, it can be used in very strong ways to decide whether things are or aren't quasi-isometry, quasi-isometric to each other. Okay, the boundary is really encoding a tremendous amount of large-scale information. Okay, that doesn't matter about the details, but that's the takeaway, that the boundary is a way of encoding in a very strong way the large-scale structure of your, of your space. Okay? All right, so that's um, hyperbolic boundaries. I think, we're, I think that's all I want to say. Um, all right, so let's move on. All right, so we want to look at, uh, we'd like to have some notion of boundaries for things that aren't hyperbolic, all right? So let's start with some cases where it's not hard to generalize just the definition of a boundary, all right? Let's just look at, um, so, so what about um, non-hyperbolic spaces? Can we still define a boundary? All right, well, let's start with an example just to see what the problems we're going to run into. So um, let's take x to be the plane. That's always our first example, R2, just the Euclidean metric, flat plane, all right? And say, OK, I'd like to define a boundary, and I'd like to understand its properties, all right? So why not? We can do the same thing. We're in the Euclidean plane. We can start with a base point or not with a base point. It doesn't matter. And we can look at all the ways of traveling to, it, to infinity, all right? Um, so um, you know, if we take a bit, fix a base point, then it's pretty clear. Once again, we're going to get a circle of directions, yeah? One for each angle. Um, by the way, if I start here, when does, what represents the same thing as this? It would have to stay bounded distance from that, which means exactly when it's parallel. Parallel line, if I don't fix a base point, then I'm just saying two parallel lines represent the same point. So it's really just the angle. It's really just a question of what angle you're, you're, you're going at. So, so the boundary is just this space, this space of um, an infinity. OK. So that's good. Seems to be fine. Um, and we can define similarly. Things are close if they stay close for a long time. This, this, all, this all works nicely, all right? Good. So we've got a, we've got a definition. So the question is, do, do the, do the um, so can define um, boundary of our um, boundary x as before, same, same definition. And we get that the boundary of R2 is the circle again, just like, just like, no problem. So far, so good, OK? OK, so now we ask, what about the, all these properties? Because this is what makes, them, makes things useful, all right? Um, Looks compact to me, looks metrizable to me. It's just the circle, yeah? OK, so, so which properties? Does it satisfy? Well, let's move up here. Um, let me just do them by number. So um, one, um, yes, we're good, we're good, yeah? Metrizable, compact, metrizable, no problem, OK. Two. Any two points on the boundary are joined by the geodesics. OK, what does that mean? So my boundary is um, the space of direction. So I want to know, can I join this point to this point? Is there a bi-infinite geodesic? Well, there's only kind of the, all the geodesics that go to this point have to be parallel to this. That's the only way they can go to this point. And if I continue them forever in the other direction, where do I get to? The antipodal point, that's the only two points that can see each other are the antipodal points. There's no bi-infinite geodesic in the plane that gets me from here to here, right? OK, bad news. So two, no, no good. All right, that one fails. Um, how about three? Let's see. Um, I want an isometry. Um, well, in fact, we have a whole group. And, and, and for four, we're going to want a whole group acting on this. So let's, what naturally acts on the plane? Let's take Z2, yeah, acting on the plane just by translation, right? Z2. So we have, we have an action. We have an action of Z2 
acting on the plane simply by take an element of Z2 and translate everything in that way. All right, OK. So if I take one of those guys, I don't care anyone in here, and do this translation, what does it do to the boundary? What's the induced map on the boundary? Well, let's try it. Um, so let me, let me erase this. So I've got my point on the boundary. It's a ray. And I'm going to translate by, say, 1 over 2 up. Let's go 1 over 2 up. So I'm going to translate this way. Yeah? But I'm going to translate the entire picture up, right? I'm translating everything, the entire plane up. So this guy, you know, everything gets translated up. It ends up looking like that, right? Parallel. It hasn't moved. It's the same point on the boundary. All right? In fact, the action, the induced action on the boundary is trivial. Trivial. The induced action on the boundary is trivial. It moves nothing. Everything goes to itself. All right? OK? So um, the induced action on the boundary is trivial. So this is simply <coughs> clearly not true. It fixes everything. And this is clearly not true. The orbit of a point is itself. It goes nowhere. All right, so we just killed 3 and 4. All right, so 3, 4 by looking at this action. Yeah, you with me? All right, okay, bad news. How about 5, which we really you know, care a lot about, at least I do, that quasi isometry invariance? Um, well, it turns out, um, so what about 5? There's this really wild. Um, there exists an isometry, uh, a quasi-isometry, uh, a quasi-isometry f from R2 to R2. Oh, I forget the exact formula to it. Um, it. It's called the logarithmic spot spiral. It's insane. So it takes a geodesic like this, and it wraps it around um, it with lo uh, log uh, it to be a logarithmic spi spiral. All right. So. Um, I say, I, what's the induced map on the boundary? Well, this represents a point on the boundary. What point does this guy represent on the boundary? Oops, we don't even have an induced map on the boundary in general. A quasi-isometry, not only is it not a homeomorphism, we don't even have a map on the boundary. All right? So things go pretty badly wrong. All right? And there are other examples, more subtle examples, where the maps exist, but they're not homeomorphisms. And you know, you can give all kinds of different examples of this. Anyway, five is bad. All right? OK, so um, believe it or not, these boundaries, um, this is an example of a, what's called the cat zero space. And believe it or not, these boundaries actually are useful anyway, but not for the same reasons that hyperbolic ones are. The, the kind of things we can do with them are somewhat different. And there clearly are some properties that are just fail horribly. All right? That can't, use, can't use any of it. All right? OK, so uh, that looks bad. Is there an example where one fails No. Uh, well, yes, probably. I'm thinking of cat zero spaces. That, that's always true. But there are, exam okay, there are examples where you can't even define it, the boundary. So um, it, what do I mean by that? You can always take ray, equivalence class of rays to infinity. So it always exists as a set. All right? But when you try to define a topology on it, it turns out that the topology I tried to explain isn't even a neighborhood basis anymore. It doesn't give a topology. And things don't. Uh, I mean, th it can get, it, it, you can get it so badly that it's hard to even know how, what you want to define the thing to be. So. Um, yeah. Davis manifolds. Yeah. They're not ANRs. The boundaries aren't ANRs. They're not ANRs, but they're boundary. But can you define a topology of some? Yeah, not metrizable. I, you can. Yeah, you can get that to fail. That's right. But I, th you can even get it to fail where you can't even figure out how to define a topology. On. I mean, there's no, not even a natural, obvious topology. So yes. So things go bad pretty quickly, pretty, pretty, pretty badly. Okay. All right. So, um, so now what? Um, well, now we want to go back to uh, our original uh, motivation. Oh, yeah. So to understand um, what I, I'm going to do next, let's look at what, what it is that goes, why it is that it fails. The, in this, this question in particular, for example, why is it that it fails here and it works for hyperbolic? What, what, what is the key thing that makes all these hyperbolic boundaries work? And it turns out that, that um, 
um, the key is, this, is something called the Morse lemma, which I mentioned last time. So let me, let me restate, because that, that's crucial to this, all right? So um, what fails? OK, so what goes wrong? And it turns out, in essence, what goes wrong is um, um, the Morse lemma fails. The answer is the Morse lemma fails. The Morse lemma fails in R2. OK, so let's recall what the Morse lemma is. Um, yeah, and I think I'll state it. Um, without too much detail this time. Let's state it informally. So um, it says, qua the Morse lemma says quasi geodesics stay bounded distance from geodesics. All right, so let's um, draw a picture. So we talked about this last time. And what we said is, if you have a quasi-geodesic and you, and you, you join uh, this with the two points with a geodesic, then there was a bound on how far away this could get from the geodesic. OK, the bound dependent. Oh, I'm sorry. This is for hyperbolic. Sorry, sorry. This, the Morse lemma works for hyperbolic. So x um, is hyperbolic. then quasi-geodesic stay bounded distance from geodesic. So this is what we have in hyperbolic spaces. This bound n depends on the quasi-constants, the lambda epsilon, blah, blah, blah. But let's not worry about that. The basic idea is you can't get too far from a geodesic. This fails horribly here, all right? So uh, y y you know, the, the quasi-geodesic, you know, as if this gets bigger and bigger, the quasi-geodesic is going to get far and farther and farther away from the geodesic connecting connecting points, all right? So this, this is what fails. This is what fails. And this is what makes everything work. So let's, um, let's just think about um, this, how we get, you know, what's going on here? What's going on here? How, uh, or even how do you get a map? So the point is, if, if, I, have a, um, um, if I have a ray to infinity, oh, yeah, let's do, do um, you know, I'm going to leave these up for a minute. Um, yeah, so given the Morse lemma, um, so if um, f mapping x into y is a quasi-isometry, then, then, um, then what do I have? I start out in x with some ray that goes to infinity. That's a point on the boundary, right? And that's my alpha. And then I map that via f to y, and I get a quasi-geodesic. Yeah? And I want to say that represents a point in a well-defined point in infinity. All right, how do I find that point in infinity? Well, I have to straighten this to, into a ray, into a geodesic ray. All right? So what do I do? I just pick a sequence of points out along here, and I connect, I connect these starting point to each one of these points. And the point is that these stay bounded distance from each other because they stay bounded distance from this. All right? So they stay bounded distance from each other. My space has closed balls are compact. There's something called Arzalea Scully. Go back to you know, your first, first year um, um, real analysis course. And it says that these converge. All right? They're going to converge. And it's easy to check that if they were all geodesic, they'll converge to a geodesic. All right? So they converge. All right? And that just, it, it's this. It's all, it's all this. It's all this. All right? So it turns out there's lots and lots of properties. So the, it, 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 it actually turns out um, to be the case that a space is hyperbolic if and only if every geodesic is Morse for some, for some fixed Morse constant. Um, so it, it, you don't want to define hyperbolic this way because it's kind of a 
to abstract. It's easier to define it as, as slim triangles. But frankly, if you start looking at you know, proofs of theorems, very often the Morse lemma is, the, is, is key to, to the proof of, of many of the theorems. All right? so, so this is a key property. And it, it basically is the, um, yeah, so, so what's the idea? So we're now going to define the Morse boundary. So the idea is what's a good direction and what's a bad direction. So a direction is a ray to infinity, and some of them are Morse and some of them aren't. And we're going to keep the ones that are Morse and toss out the ones that aren't. That's the way we're going to decide whether a direction is good or bad. All right. So we're going to say pretty much everything we need to do, we want to do for boundaries, somehow depends on this Morse lemma. So let's just stick with the things that are Morse and throw out the others. All right. OK, so that's the definition of the Morse boundary. So Morse boundary. OK, what conditions do I need here? All right, so now let x be any, um, I guess I still want proper, closed balls are compact, so proper geodesic metric space. So it doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be hyperbolic anymore. Any proper geodesic um, metric space um, um, yeah. Um, so I get, uh, yeah, I guess I was going to define formally what I meant by Morse. Maybe I will. OK, so I want to say when a ray is Morse. So definition, I have a map from the interval into x. Um, um, sorry. So let um, be a geodesic. And by the way, um, mostly we're interested in rays, but this definition works whether that's a finite interval, a bi-infinite interval, a half infinite, it doesn't matter. We're mostly going to be interested in these half infinite intervals, but we can do it for any geodesic. Um, um, so given, so here's the problem. Huh. Maybe this is too technical. Given a function from um, the positive reals cross the positive reals to the positive reals. <laughs> Um, um, we say alpha is n Morse. This is sometimes referred to as the Morse gauge um, if every lambda epsilon quasi geodesic beta with endpoints on alpha stays um, in the n alpha beta uh, lambda epsilon neighborhood of alpha. OK, let me just draw you a picture. This is, I know this is technical, but it's sort of the key definition. So we want to say when. I have my alpha, and I want to say, do I like this alpha or do I not like this alpha? All right. So I want to make sure that if I have a quasi-geodesic that starts and ends on alpha, that it doesn't get too far away from alpha. That's what, those are the good guys, right? as long as those stay not too far. So I just have to say, what do I mean by not too far? I mean there's some constant such that you know, the distance is at most n. The problem is there's no way to limit that constant if I don't tell you how badly quasi this is. Quasi can be qua you know, a little quasi or badly quasi. And so unfortunately, this n depends on, the, the, on how quasi, how distorted this, this thing is. Don't worry about that too much. All you have to think really is that you, you just want to make sure that the quasi geodesics that start and end on alpha stay bound at distance from alpha. OK, that bound depends on something. But um, all right, so that's, that's the way to think of it. OK, so let's go back to, um, um, oh no, let me, let me define the, um, uh, what's next? So let's define the Morse boundary, and then we'll do an example. All right, so we're now going to ready to define the Morse boundary. Um, 
the Morse boundary of, um, of x is um, given by, so let's call it boundary sub m for Morse. And we simply take the set of alpha such that alpha is um, a Morse ray. So Morse ray meaning there exists some n for which this is n Morse. All right? I don't care what n. There exists an n for which, for which this is n Morse. All right? um, same, same thing. If two things stay bound in distance from each other, they're equivalent. So I'm just saying, I'm just, I'm just taking the rays to infinity like I did before, equivalence class of rays. It's just that I'm only going to allow good ones and not bad ones. If things can get arbitrarily, like, oh, it's gone. But that spiral, if things can get arbitrarily far away from the geodesic, forget it. I don't want them. Throw them away. All right? It's not allowed. All right? So, um, um, all right, so I, I'm going to just throw this in for a minute. Um, um, uh, uh, see, yeah. So often we actually want to limit how Morse. We want to pick a Morse function and only allow those. Um, so alpha such that alpha is n Morse. So that's a subset of these. And in fact, it turns out that the way to define the topology is you first topologize this guy just like we did before, and then you just pass to the direct limit. I'm not going to write that out. But, but the, the main thing is, to a large extent, we work here and then just pass to the direct limit to, to, to um, understand these. Because here, it, they're all Morse, but they're worse Morse and worse Morse and worse Morse. So we usually work with a bounded piece of it and then, and then go from there. OK, so all right. So what's the point? Oh, no, let's do examples. We don't have a lot of time, and then we'll go through our list of properties and see what do we know and what do we not know. I'm not erasing those properties for a reason, all right? Um, so what do we know and what do we not know? Uh, I mean, what, what are the examples first? Um, OK. All right, example. All right, well, there is one possibility, which is um, supposing we do R2. I say, I'm only going to take the rays that are Morse. How many? There aren't any. The boundary's empty. All right. So there are spaces for which the, for which the Morse boundary is empty. And um, those, it's not going to tell us a huge amount about those spaces. Although, you'll see, it does tell you something about those spaces. But, 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 um, but um, OK, so that's one extreme, right? The other extreme is that if x happens to be hyperbolic, all right, then not only is everything Morse, but it turns out everything's Morse for a fixed n that depends only on delta. There's actually one n. So that this guy equals this guy. If we take n big enough, then this guy equals this guy equals the entire boundary we started with. So the Morse boundary is the, or is the original Gromov boundary, all right, Gromov boundary. The one I told, talked about originally. All right, we haven't changed anything. All right, so the two extremes are nothing and the boundary we started with. All right, then there's everything in between, so let's do our tree of flats. Uh, sorry? No, it's empty. There's no rays to infinity. There's no geodesic things that go. Yeah, it's got to be a geodesic to infinity, so. Um, array is a map from, uh, is a geodesic from here into x, so it's got to, you know, be length preserving for, um, it's a, it's a, it's an isometric embedding, if you want, of the interval into, um, okay, so tree of flats. Okay, this is the interesting one, right, that we said where we, we have some good things and some, okay, what's Morse? Yeah, it, it's allowed to be in a flat for a while because, you know, if, they, if it's only in a flat for a little while, then only little bits of it can go bad. So it turns out a ray is Morse if and only if it spends a bounded amount of time in any flat it enters. So it could go a little while over here, then it's got to go up for a while. Then it might spend a little time in this next flat, and then it's got to go up for a while. But the amount of time it spends in any one of those flats has to be uniformly bounded. And how bounded, how long, oh, is it allowed to spend one unit or 100 units is going to determine how Morse. They're all going to be Morse as long as there's a bound, but the, the size of that bound will determine how Morse it is. 
All right? So you're going to get things that are arbitrarily badly morsed, but are still morse. You know, I mean, that n could get really big, but it's still, it's still morse. So, um, um, so the point is um, boundary m x equal um, um, g that rays that spend um, bounded time, uniformly bounded time in any flat. Some uniformly bounded time. By the way, if we bound the time, you know, if we fix our n, and so we bound the amount of time. So I'm going to let this thing spend at most four, you know, be, have the pieces in a flat are going to be at most length four, let's say. Let's just say that. What does this thing look like? So I start somewhere. I could travel a little bit in this flat, and then I have to go up or down. And then I could travel a little bit in this flat and then go up or down. This thing really is quasi-isometric to a tree. I mean, this basically looks like a tree. I mean, OK, I, if, if you collapse all those little disks, you just get a tree with some finite, some finite um, number of things coming off at each point. Okay, So these things are going to be cantor sets. And this thing is going to be some kind of direct limit of cantor sets. All right? So you can actually see what you're getting. You can actually see it. Okay. So, sorry, horrible, right? Topologically yeah, horrible. Yeah, topologically <laughs> horrible. Topologically horrible, but really useful. So what properties do they satisfy? All right? So let's go back to our properties and say, OK, now what? Can we, you know, let's apply this to the Morse the Morse boundary now, all right? So um, what properties? Um, the uh, boundary M satisfy. And I, I need to make an assumption here. Um, so I'm going to make two assumptions. I'm going to, um, uh, no, I only need one. Um, oh, oh, before I do this, I, should, I need to mention some names here. So this is all recent work. So this is um, um, uh, myself and Harold Sultan. We, we were the ones to first introduce this idea of the Morse boundary. And then uh, my former student, Devin Murray. Um, we were looking at the case of, uh, of a cat zero spaces. We did all of the things I'm going to list below here for cat zero. Um, then Matt Cordes. And uh, a current student of mine, Ching Yu, they um, did the generalization to more general, to general spaces, really to any x or any group g. Also, for for I mean, they completely generalized from the cat zero to the to the general case. Um, okay, so um, let me list, and that that'll be the end. We're just about there. So. So our assumption, my assumption here is only that I have a, a, a geometric action. So um, x equal proper geodesic space, metric space, and g is acting geometrically on x. That's all my assumption is. All right, no other condition. All right. So um, then um, um, one. Um, all right, um, compact matrizable. <clears throat> well, mm, it turns out that these guys are compact matrizable. These guys aren't necessarily. So the best I can say here is that boundary um, M N X is compact and matrizable. All right, but then you pass the direct limit, and you usually lose compactness. We don't know if you lose, yeah, and matrizability even most of the time. So, so okay, that's the best we can do on that. That's unfortunately so. So the one thing that still worked for the plane is now not quite working so well. Um, okay, any two points are joined by a geodesic in X. Yes, exactly that statement works. All right, visibility. We can see anything from any any anything from anything. It works. All right. Um, um, three, if we have an infinite order isometry, then um, it fixes at most two points on the boundary. Yes, correct. All right, we don't have any of this. Just Oh, so uh, yeah, most two points. That, that's correct, right. Um, four, um, um, if, if I look at the entire group action instead of a single isometry, 
I want the um, orbits to be um, dense. That's true, except in the case where G is uh, virtually cyclic and the entire space is just a line. I mean, there is the one special case where, the, where you just have Z acting on the line. But assuming G is not virtually cyclic, that's also true. All right? So, um, so let's say, in fact, let's say it for four, um, assume, assuming, assume um, that there are at least three points. Let's do this. Assume that the Morse boundary contains at least three points. Just throw out the, the throw, out, throw out the trivial cases. Then, then, um, then yes, this 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 condition holds. All right. Um, five, the one we cared about. This is what got us started on the whole project. Is um, just about right, except I we don't have quasi-conformal because we don't quasi-conformal. You need a metric. All right. So we have to. We we're going to get rid of quasi-conformal completely. And I want to say that this statement is true. Unfortunately, we need one other small um, uh, condition, which is basically not difficult, but didn't, come, didn't arise in that. So let me write out 5. So 5, and this was a recent theorem we proved. So um, one direction we proved in our original paper, and the other direction was recent. So, um, it, it, given a quasi-isometry, and now this is between any two proper geodesic metric spaces, all right, we get, um, on the one hand, we get an induced map, which is a homeomorphism. And, and, and by the way, this is, this is true even, stupidly, even if these are empty. Being empty is a quasi-isometry invariant. If you have two spaces that are quasi-isometry and one of them has an empty that Morse boundary, then the other one has an empty Morse boundary. So even that is a quasi-isometry invariant. OK, but now I want conditions that allow me to go back the other direction. All right. So again, quasi-Mobius turns out to work, except now we need quasi-Mobius um, and, not or, and um, something called too stable, which is um, really pretty straightforward. It, 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 I, I'm not going to write it out. It basically says, if I have um, two points here joined by an n, n Morse thing, then the, the, car, then the, the image of those two points here is joined by an n prime Morse thing, where n prime depends only on n. It just says that the Morseness doesn't get too terribly messed up when you mo move from one to the other. You ba bound the Morseness. All right, so don't, it's, it's a technical condition. Don't worry, but you need it. So this way, then you get, then you get the other way. So anytime you have a homeomorphism with these two properties, it necessarily came from a quasi-isometry on the spaces. You can construct the quasi-isometry. So once again, I've gone over, and that's the end. But hopefully, I, I guess the takeaway is um, we think these things are almost like hyperbolic boundaries, and we hope they'll be useful to do similar, similar kinds of things for more general spaces. So. Okay. Thank you. Yes. I'm not saying anything. Oh, oh no. So, oh, I'm sorry. You're absolutely right. That statement also needs this. Oh, you're absolutely right. That it, both of four and five require require this. Thank you. Yes, I do need I do need the um, that condition here too. Yeah. Yeah. The other case, although this works for two two points, because you can show that it's only virtually sick. It works for two points. I don't think there is a case where it's only one point. I don't think we've ever, I don't think you can come up with a, but for empty, it doesn't say, it's not saying, yeah, we're not claiming anything for empty. In this last example, do we know that the boundary is a homogeneous space if you have a homeomorphism taking any points in the I don't, well, you have, not any points, any points. I mean, you do have the fact that the group, um, let me think about that. I think. He wants to know whether there are homeomorphisms just of the boundary, not necessarily induced, but yeah, of the boundary that take any point to any other point. Um, yeah, can't, uh, my guess is yes, but I'd have to think about it to really construct it. Because you could do it right on the, fine, on the fixed, on the Cantor sets, right? And then you need to see if that can, I'm not absolutely sure, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you do have this fact that the group actions 
the orbits are dense, so you can move any point to any other point in its orbit, right? And then maybe with some limiting argument, I don't, um, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. Oh, oh, absolutely. In fact, in fact, um, one of the theorems, um, uh, I, I definitely true for cat zero. I can't remember if Liu's proved it yet for more general. I think he has, but um, is that for the cat zero case? If it, if if there's a boundedly more, if it's boundedly Morse, then um, you want to know can it get arbitrarily badly Morse, right? And, but not have any non Morse. Oh, I see. I see. I see. I see. Oh, okay. I see. That's different. Okay, I didn't understand the question. Because what, what I was going to tell you about this theorem that he proved is if it's boundedly Morse, then it's hyperbolic. Then right. your space is hyperbolic. So you're not, you know, it's not interesting in a way for us. So um, whether they're unboundedly Morse, but there don't exist any. Not uh, only if they're boundedly Morse. Only if they're Morse for a bounded Morse, you know, they don't get worse and worse Morse. That, then it's equivalent to being hyperbolic. But you want to allow arbitrarily badly Morse, but nothing that isn't. There's an interesting example of a case, I wonder if this example would work here, of a case where um, there are Morse geodesics but no um, um, Morse geodesics, which are ax axes of group. No, no um, 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 what are they called? Ah, the words just skip me. The ones that repeat over and over and over again. Periodic, periodic thank you. There are no periodic <laughs> Morse geodesics. There, um, <laughs> it would be, it would be, I, I, my, my guess is yes, and I don't have one uh, uh, on the top of my head, but it would be a kind of weirdo constructed, yeah, but I, my guess is yes, that you could do it. Um, so some of these things you can do, it's easy to construct just spaces that have all kinds of weird properties. To construct ones with a, with a co-compact, you know, it, they're nicer when you put this in. If you don't require this, I could construct anything you want for you. But um, um, the ones that have the nice properties, we assume that there's this nice action on. So yeah, I'm sure I could construct one for you if you, don't, if you let me throw away the, the group action. That's, um. Yeah, the, everything's in a flat, right? Yeah, so Forget it. Sense. Empty. Forget it. As soon as you can put everything, every geodesic in a flat, it's empty. Um. Right, we should probably let Bruce go, not home, but somewhere else, right? Montreal. Montreal. <laughs> All right. But this has been a really fine, nice series of lectures. Well, thank you. I've enjoyed everybody. has been so... <laughs>